I'm not going to say very much about my publications except for one. Uh, this is uh, a version of, a, of a, an article that I published in the uh, International History Review. So if you want a fuller vo version of the story I'm going to tell you, you can, you can find it there. Um, and uh, the only other thing I would say is that I, I came to this topic uh, as a research assistant asked to find out what we could about uh, Mackenzie King's role in the creation of the continuous journey stipulation. And so I turned to his diary, so I've actually brought props with me. So his diary, um, for the, about the two months when he was on a diplomatic mission uh, in basically trying to formulate Canada's policy regarding Indian immigration, he uh, also had a mission to Washington. He wrote one of what he called his special diaries, and he wrote 543 pages. The red is volume one, the second is volume two. I don't know if any of you keep a diary, but King, over his lifetime, wrote 13,000 pages in his diary, and I'd like somebody to ask me about this document and its history, and why it's not better known, but I don't have time to tell you. Was he a bachelor? <laughs> no. Did he have children? No. Uh, but, uh... <laughs> we have lots of time, so I'm going to relax. Uh, yes, he had several dogs, all named Pat. Uh, but, <clears throat> he tells a story in those 543 pages, and I'm not going to be able to, to relay it all, uh, but I'm going to give you a version of it, and, and I... Uh, I think a critical reading uh, of the way he tells his role in this story. It begins like a, an adventure novel, uh, and he's talking to the Prime Minister. Uh, he says, I think, Sir Wilfred, that my trip to Washington was something more than a personal visit. I might almost say that the United States is on the verge of war with Japan. At this, the Premier's face visibly changed. He took me by the arm and walked back to his office, opened the door, and asked me to be seated. And this uh, story that uh, King had gone to Washington, met with Theodore Roosevelt, uh, and that this launched him on this diplomatic mission to uh, avert uh, a Japanese-American war is the driving uh, force of King's narrative. And he, uh, no longer reading, so he has a lot of doors that open for him as a result of his conversations with Theodore Roosevelt in Washington. And there's an American uh, side of this story that I will be dealing with in only very broad strokes so that I can get to the English uh, side of his story. In 1908, when King embarks on his mission in diplomacy, he is a 32-year-old uh, deputy minister in the Department of Labor. He is a, an extremely ambitious civil servant. He is about, he is negotiating with the Liberal Party to launch his political career. Uh, and this diary tells us a great deal about King's maneuvering to create himself as what he called a public man, which would be to put part of what he also calls in the document the ruling class, which was a class we see in this document that extended in England, Washington, uh, as well as with a smaller branch in Ottawa. And in the story, the part that I want to tell you about, he does say something about how continuous journey, the continuous journey stipulation became part of Canadian immigration law. And this stipulation, for those of you who were at uh, Professor Johnson's talk, is the uh, legislation that leads to the Komagata Maru incident. And there is a legal history pertaining to the Montego, which I will, which you can sort of see on the screen here. Um, but uh, where this, as Professor Johnson said this morning, where this comes from is uh, uh, King's role in investigating the, uh, the, the Vancouver race riot of 1907. And ultimately, the anti-Asian agitation uh, sought to curtail Asian immigration from all 
uh, of all nationalities. So with uh, China, there was a hit tax. With Japan, there was a so-called gent gentleman's agreement. But the exclusion of South Asian immigrants posed the problem, because unlike Chinese and Japanese, they were British subject British subjects, and so it would be embarrassing for the British rule in India for Canada to pass explicit uh, legislation banning their entry uh, to Canada. And so to solve this problem, uh, when uh, the journey of the Monteagle to Canada is learned about, is why uh, King is sent to London. So before King gets sent to London, and I'm just uh, now really paraphrasing, he has this remarkable lunch at the White House. And I think it's important that I tell you about this because one of the key aspects of this story is that there was a, a perceived uh, <coughs> continuity of interest between Canada and the United States when it came to Asian immigration. And what Roosevelt wanted King to do was to convey to the British this uh, common North American desire to uh, completely exclude all Asians from immigration. And this was relevant because uh, Britain had a treaty with, uh, with Japan. And Roosevelt was concerned that if war came with Japan, that he would be at war with Britain. So Theodore Roosevelt engages on a whole variety of both formal and informal diplomatic strategies to try and convey this uh, circumstance to British authorities. And inviting the young Mackenzie King to the White House, it turns out, was one of those strategies. And the reason King gets invited is because he had investigated the 7th September 1907 race riot in Vancouver, where a mob of about a thousand broke away from a Vancouver uh, meeting of the Vancouver branch of the Asi Asiatic Exclusion League and rioted through this Chinese district of the city. There was much less damage done in Little Tokyo, where Japanese Canadian population organized in self-defense, uh, but it was this lesser damage that had international ramifications for the Canadian government. Because of the Anglo-Japanese Treaty, uh, Laurier's government appointed the king to investigate and make restitution to the Japanese Canadians. Much later, after much pressure from British authority, restitution is also made to the uh, Chinese community, which was subject of damage. But what King has been telling officials secretly, which is not in his report, and one of the things that it provides the entree to his uh, lunch at the White House, is that he had discovered a secret plot by Japan to uh, exceed the normal amount of immigration permitted to Canada. So investigating, he discovers a large number of passports issued by the Japanese government at something called the Canada Nippon Supply Company. And so King believes that this is uh, documentary evidence that the Japanese government is deliberately and clandestinely, clandestinely violating its tacit agreement with Canada about limiting immigration. And while he leaves this out of his official report, he passes it on to the Governor General and to the Governor General's friend, a guy named Colonel McCook, who tells Roosevelt that King has this kind of documentary evidence. And so this is why he gets invited to lunch and then a whole series of meetings where King says he has proof that the Japanese government has the, a plan to um, clandestinely bring new immigrants to North America. So I want to tell you, from the beginning, King is basically wrong about the evidence that he found. Um, Canada had entered into the Anglo-Japanese Treaty uh, in 1906. It was a treaty of 1894. They entered it in 1906. Largely because they have great hopes that they can export a lot of wheat from, to Japan and make money, and they have an assurance from a consul general uh, who's visiting Canada at the time, that the agreement on uh, immigration will still stand. Um, it turns out that the Consul General did not communicate this to the Japanese government, and they felt that when Canada signed on to the treaty, that the, the gentleman's agreement was now no longer enforced. So one of Canada's first independent diplomatic missions is to send King's boss, 
the Minister of Labor to Japan to, negotiate, to renegotiate the gentleman's agreement that severely limited Japanese immigration to Canada. So this is the context uh, where he goes to the United States and fuels Roosevelt's fear that uh, there is the possibility of uh, war with Japan. King greatly magnifies this in his reports back to Ottawa. And ultimately, after much back and forth, Laurier finds it incredibly difficult to believe that the President of the United States would want to use King as this informal diplomat rather than the British ambassador or uh, the American ambassador in London. Nevertheless, he, he prevails, and what Laurier says is, uh, after King has come back of what turns into several trips to Washington, he says, well, we now have a very good reason for sending you to England. The Monteagle has sailed, so this is a ship, the Monteagle has sailed for Canada with a shipload of Hindus. I should just say, this is the language of the diary, uh, and this is the language Hindus, which described South Asians of a uh, huge variety. But this is what, this is the language that King and Laurier use. We will have to send them back. Uh, if the order in council, and by this he means continuous journey, is not sufficient, I will favor allowing the British Columbia Exclusion Act to be applied to them. And King had already suggested that to find a pretense to send him to London to deliver these secret messages from Roosevelt to London, that some excuse could be used that he could go to talk about Indian immigration. But the cover story now actually becomes the motivation for the mission. So, uh, okay, I've got about half of my time to cover part of the paper I really want to deliver. So, <clears throat> King uh, arrives in London, and what I want to focus on today is the way King uh, frames the problem of Indian immigration and the kind of discourse of race that emerges uh, among these elites, with the aristocratic class that uh, uh, Hugh Johnson was telling us about today. So, uh, King, the first thing he records on his diary on arrival is he, he goes to a church and he records a, tra uh, a prayer that he might be prepared to play the strong part in the history of Canada, which may help bring the people of this country nearer to the principles of righteousness which exalteth a nation, and which it is the purpose of God in my life that I shall do. King never underestimated his own divine <laughs> mission. But God worked in mysterious ways. As soon as King is off the boat, he gives an interview to the Morning Post. And uh, the Morning Post reports that King fears a terrible outbreak of racial violence in Canada. And the, uh, the dangerous problem is magnified by the influence of British Columbia socialists. Now this is exactly what King says in many parts of the diary. but. King claims that he has been misquoted. He certainly didn't want to be uh, perceived to be saying these things in public. So with men, most of the meetings begin with King explaining how he didn't say the things that were in the morning post. Uh, and after that fact, he's very cagey with reporters. And he develops personal relationships with them, cultivates them, and actually this becomes quite significant um, later on. And there were other hurdles uh, to overcome. Uh, I'm going to get to the moment where I'll refer to the article in the Times that Crippen wrote with Johnson. I'm pretty sure this is the one you're referring to. <coughs> so, where an actual observer sees the way the passengers of uh, Montego were treated. But there were uh, other hurdles as well. So, um, Foreign Secretary Edward Gray is frankly dubious that uh, King's story about war between the United States and Japan uh, is true. And Gray has had a lot of uh, back and forth with Roosevelt, and he's learned everything that King is supposed to be deli delivering secretly anyway. Um, and Gray is also not very sympathetic about uh, King's claims that the British government should do something to prevent Indian immigration to Canada. Um, King meets with the Canadian High Commissioner, Lord Strathcona, who points out that there's great difficulty in restricting immigration of Indians because, of course, they are British subjects. And King suggests this is exactly why he had been sent to England. We were anxious, if possible, to avoid the necessity of having to enact legislation 
which would affect British subjects. We need to keep them out, but we don't want to enact legislation that will actually achieve this goal. So possibly the British government would be able to devise a means which would render this unnecessary. But initially, at least, King finds the British government extremely reluctant to take such action. Lord Elgin, Secretary of State for the Colonies, did not accept King's claim that Canada's climate was unsuitable for Indian immigrants. He mentioned that in India there were cold districts as well as warm regions. He then asked me from what part the Hindus had come. King has no idea. He, he then goes and talks to, he said, well, I'll check my notes. Uh, it comes up later. Uh, he finds a, a good explanation of which kinds of Hindus are coming to Canada. The Secretary of State for India says, you're treating the Japanese much more generously than our own people, the Indians. Since, uh, with the gentleman's agreement, you actually permit some conditional immigration from Japan, but you're seeking complete uh, exclusion of Indians. But King explains, okay. Uh, King explains that the feelings against the Hindus was, it's not the same as the feeling against the Japanese. In the case of the latter, there's genuine fear. That's the Japanese. In the case of the Hindus, it's a matter of pity. They were not suited to the country and were being subjected to unnecessary suffering and the consequences of coming. So it's for their own good that they will uh, seek a total exclusion. And King takes a similar line with Elgin. Many of the Hindus are in the habit of walking about the streets in groups insufficiently clothed. And where they had come in numbers, they don't have employment, they suffer great hardships, and a number of them have died. There's 5,000 of them, I suspect. A few would have died. Um, why then had they come, Elgin wondered. And uh, King says, they've heard about the great wealth of Canada, and the wealth is there, but the Hindu is not the man to get it out. When this story comes out about the treatment of the passengers of the Monteagle, where the reporter is absolutely appalled uh, uh, that these many of them decorated veterans of the British Army in India are being uh, indefensibly discriminated against. And he quotes one of the passengers saying, we are subjects of the king, why do they keep us out? Uh, and the Times correspondent says, there are, there's grave danger of disaffection or even mutiny among the native troops if these men are deported. And King gets asked about the government's action by Morley. Uh, and he says that this uh, is just an unfortunate coincidence. The order in council has been aimed at preventing Japanese immigration by way of Hawaii, and so it is uh, because of the Anglo, okay, to quote, because of the Anglo-Japanese alliance, it was necessary not to single out the Japanese in legislation or regulation. Hence, the Montego passengers were being deported because the Canadian government wished to avoid discrimination. <laughs> he's a clever, uh, and so uh, he's morally suddenly is starting to become sympathetic uh, to King because he says, you know, uh, matters are very serious in India and we can't afford uh, open sedition. So, three days later, King is back in Morley's office when he's handed a cable sent from Udai Ram, uh, who wrote on behalf of a mass meeting of Indian immigrants in Vancouver. And the cable explains that the meeting had been held to protest the deportations, and that their brother subjects in India would resent the indifference of British authorities were they failed to fail to, in giving protection to them in connection with their deportation. So, Morley wants to know about this, so King is thousands of miles from Vancouver, and Morley asks him how many Indians might be at such a mass meeting. King, the supposed expert on West Coast agitation, replies 120 or 130. Even though there are uh, at least 5,000 Indians living in British Columbia, one can only guess how King arrives at these figures. Uh, but when King uh, again encounters Morley's question about climactic zones, King says, the class of Indians who have come thus far uh, seem to be from the parts of India that are not as cold. And they do not appear to be strong enough and are unsuited in other ways for life in Canada. Morley finally says, you have convinced me. So I'm going to uh, go a little bit ahead. 
to the, to the end here, where it's the meetings outside of these official meetings where King starts to build a case for the British to act. Uh, and he has many, uh, many, many social events, and at all of them, he talks about the issues of, uh, of Asian immigration. And, uh, and he advances and finds broad sympathy with his idea, uh, which he borrows from Governor General Earl Grey, that there are particular zones of the world uh, which should be reserved for the particular races. And this is... Uh, the way King can express these views while claiming to abhor racialism in all its forms. And uh, at one of his social meetings with a, with a journalist and author, Richard Jebb, Jebb talks about uh, the subject of the Indian Emigration Act. And uh, there were provisions in it to prevent Indians from uh, being exploited as indentured labor. And uh, King then takes this information to Morley and Elegant and says, if this could be uh, applied to Canada. And Elegant makes the obvious objection that the people coming to Canada were not, in fact, indentured labor. And King said, well, can indentured be read to mean contract? And Morley picks up on what King is getting at. And so he gets his legal advisor to see whether the Indian Act can be made uh, applicable. And the reason why King wants this, because he's heard, had a cable from Laurier saying that they've made arrangements with the Canadian Pacific Railroad that it's no longer possible to get a through ticket that will allow uh, immigrants from South Asia to fulfill the continuous journey stipulation. But he explains to the British uh, officials that we've effected an agreement with the CPR, but we could hardly have the public know. It would hardly do for the government of Canada to tell the people that the immigration question had been settled by an arrangement between the government and a private corporation. So Morley's legal advisor finds that an Indian could not lawfully emigrate under contract to work in Canada without the Canadian government first passing laws for the protection of Indians in Canada, which would subsequently be approved by the Indian government. Needless to say, the Canadian government had no intention of passing any such laws. King immediately cabled Laurier with the good news. Um, and King is immensely pleased with himself. Uh, it goes on here at, at the end of my one minute. And the continuous journey stipulation was extremely effective. Between 1908 and 1915, only about 100 uh, Indians gained admission to Canada. The narrative uh, has, from his perspective, a happy ending. But um, what comes clear in the story, which is not part of the political narrative of the story, is A, this group that King calls a governing class, uh, King recognizes it and he says, it seeks to control and actually does control and guide the national interests both, in uh, both in England and the dominions beyond. And King is navigating it both inside official channels and outside them in these teas and luncheons, which are uh, elaborate. And then the second thing is that this governing class shares broadly a conception of race. And King, as I said, distinguishes between race prejudice and natural measures that ensure races are segregated. King explains his perspective to Root uh, Elihu Root, the American Secretary of State, using the metaphor of the human family. The peace of the world would perhaps be best promoted by an understanding between the peoples of different continents as to the parts of the world to which their several populations should be confined. King said, of course, there's that doctrine of our common humanity and human brotherhood, but that I thought we might well say, um, uh, to that I thought we might well say that the peace of the family was sometimes best kept and friendly relations promoted by brothers and their families not sharing one household. So yes, we are all part of one family, but you know, you got to move out of the basement and get your own place, essentially. And Root agrees and expands King's metaphor, moving over to the garden, just because I recognize my neighbor as a brother, 
Root says, I am not thereby obliged to allow him to come into my yard and do what he wishes with my property, to plant his seeds in my garden and take what he can out of my soil. Uh, and this uh, view is widely shared. And that, in Root, he's bringing up fears of miscegenation. And, and it's interesting to note about the interracial marriage. And, the, uh, and these fears were high among the governing class. All agreed, it seemed, that North America must belong to the white races. The means of achieving this without provoking anti-imperial sentiment in India or endangering trade with Japan was challenging for bureaucrats like Mackenzie King. But his prayers were answered. His mission did, as he put it, help him play a strong part in the history of Canada. Whether or not he brought the people of this country any nearer to the principles of righteousness is another question entirely. Thank you.